What's up, quarterback fans, college football fans? Welcome to another QB Spotlight video, YouTube episode, podcast. Wherever you are watching this or listening to this, thank you for tuning in. As always, we bring quarterback content on a weekly basis. And today we have a really, really cool guest. We have UTSA quarterback coach Sean Davis. So he's going to come in. We're going to talk a, a lot of quarterback topics. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about the development of the quarterback. But, but, but Coach Davis, before we dive into that, would you mind giving people some some insight what a Division One college quarterback coach schedule looks like, like right now? Like a week before campus starting obviously you know you had a, a little break in the summer and now you're kind of kind of ramping up before the the, the camp starts yeah so it, it's the nature of college football has changed probably not probably in the last two to three years right um so you can now practice in the summer with a ball um and so the way we've chosen to do it here at utsa um is in the spring during spring recruiting as our support staff um ga's analysts all that they go on vacation um, and then when we get back to summer, the first three or four weeks of summer, basically the recruiting period, we're doing camps and we're doing our OTAs with our players. We go twice a week for, for anywhere between nine and, and 12 periods. Um, and so, um, obviously you're, you're scripting that, um, you're, you're building installations in, installs and all that, doing the drawings, et cetera. So it is, it is, um, um, intensive um in terms of the the prep standpoint and then you're going out there coaching um and so uh then we get four weeks off during the dead period or three and a half whatever it is for for on-field mm. coaches um and i've been both i've been an analyst and, and an on-field guy so um we had some time off and and so we took that vacation and then came back for coaching school um here in texas and then um had like four or five more days off and so this is our week before Training camp, our players report. So everybody's back in the office this week. Um, had two OTAs this week. Players are off for the next five days. Um, and so I know people have chosen to do it differently. It's kind of yeah. um, different, um, I think, school to school in terms of staff vacation and, you know, OTAs. That's what we call them, right. but your summer practice schedule. So that's how we've done it. Um, you know, it is it is always interesting and challenging just as a, as a coach to to be on vacation and to be relaxing and you're doing a little bit of work, but you know, I have, I have a wife and I have two young boys, a four year old and an 18 month old. And mm -hmm. so vacation, I try to be fully present. Um, cause you don't, you don't get much vacation in this right. job. And so, right. um, it's, you got to kind of flip that switch or understand how to, what your process is as a person, as a coach to come off of vacation and go back into coaching mode. Okay. Um, and so, uh, that's where we're at right now, kind of this week of, transition from vacation to office hours from vacation to OTAs and then from all of that stuff to starting training camp next week. Yeah, I know y'all y'all about to, to hit that grind. Does does recruiting ever slow down? Has it slow does it slow down whenever you're no, vacation? Yeah. It doesn't. It, <laughs> it does not now, slow right? down. No, it's it's gotten crazier. And and I don't mean that in a negative way. Um, right. Just the the schedule is crazier, you know, with spring official visits now. Yeah. Uh, our spring and summer official visits now you know we had a lot like june used to be a slow month and now between camps and recruiting and official visits like now it's the craziest month yeah um because not very many people people still do in season official visits but you're not doing them um i don't think near as many i mean we probably did maybe five last season maybe you know and then june was packed and so um, the nature of the calendar and and recruiting is is it's still crazy. It's still fast and it's still busy and you got to love it. You got to love being relational. You got to love yep. evaluating and then you got to love just the process of it. If you're not process driven and if you're not committed to that process, it's going to be an arduous task. Um, and there's still times where it is. However, um, it's a player's game. You yeah. have really good players around you. T t talking about recruiting and talking about camp starting up. So I, I know you've been coaching pretty much since you stopped playing college football. Uh, I played at a small school in college. And, and so uh, we, we kind of understand what camp looks like. It's, it's not just a two a day. It's a full day event for almost right. a month. So it's just a grueling thing. So we've had a few other coaches and quarterbacks on and kind of they've given their perspective and kind of their viewpoint on on camp. So I'm, I'm interested if you can one talk about camp a little bit and give people a, a more of an insight of what camp really is like than two the recruiting process during camp like how do you manage that whenever you're fully busy like um because you're, you're busier there in camp than probably you know sometimes during the season depending on the week so if you can kind of just give a, an insight to to those two two topics there yeah so during training camp it's it's our fall camp whatever you call it it's yeah. it's a dead period for recruiting so you can't have anybody on campus so that part is nice so when you are recruiting it's 
text messages. It's getting guys to call you. You're you're writing letters or you're doing evals, watching film. Um, so that part of it is is nice, and that you don't have fifty guys coming in and out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, camp. We're, we are very fortunate here. Our camp schedule is is pretty phenomenal. Um, you know, I, one of the things that we hang our hat on is efficiency as a staff, as a program, you know, we value people's time from the head coach down. He values our time. He values our players' time. He's, he's going to do everything he can to take care of us as people, as players, as coaches. Um, and time is, is, is valuable for all of us. And so um, there's a ton of thought, forethought that goes into how the day is structured, how practices are structured. And that's true everywhere. But there's not a lot of dead time. And so for us, you know, we're start, starting meetings at 6 a.m., we meet, you know, it's, it's tape and treatment in the morning and meetings, and we flip flop that schedule. O and D team meeting, special team meeting. Then we're out on the field. We're practicing in the morning. South Texas heat, you know, it can get crazy. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so we're, we're practicing in the morning, and then after that, typically as coaches, we have anywhere from an hour to an hour and a half for ourselves. You can, like, obviously you're going to shower, uh, but you can work out. You can do recruit. Like literally, that's your little window to do whatever the heck you want. You work out, leave campus, run errands, be a normal human, whatever it is. Like we have that window and that is ours. Um, 98% of us, you know, if we don't work out first thing in the morning, then we're going to use that window to work out. And then we're going to get a head start on practice film, recruiting, whatever it is. But that time is carved out for us. And then from there, obviously, it's the structure of the day. You're watching film. You're watching as a staff, staff meeting, watching it with your players. Then you go to dinner and then you install at night for the next day. And then we have our evening walkthrough. So all in all, it's about a 13 to 14 hour day. But in terms of training camp, like it's that sounds like a lot. But I, we've all been a part of yeah. programs and places where it's 16, 18 hours. It's it's nonsense right. and it's craziness. Right. And so um, we we are very efficient and, and we take pride in that. And our players love it. I mean, that's one of the reasons we're fresh in November. Mm-hmm. We're efficient during the year from fall camp to end season with our time and how we practice and how we take care of people. That's, that's dope. And, and talking about the heat, we're over in Austin, Texas. We're probably yeah. 70 minutes away from y'all. So it's not, it's not uncommon to have 105 degree heat 10 days in a row, you know, it's right. just kind of, kind of part of it. Um, and so taking care of the players is, is such a, a big focus on right now. And I think, you know, just being in Texas, we hear so much stuff. You know, we train a lot of of, of quarterbacks and baseball and football players. And so mm-hmm. the the UTSA program, y'all had so much success as of late. Uh, but then what we hear about even more just through the grapevine is like how much everyone loves the program, the coaches, and they take care of people. So not that I'm selling UTSA to anyone. I just want to, you know, <laughs> get, give, give some flowers and say like we, we're, we're hearing that. So what you're saying lines up with kind of what we just hear in general. Um, so not not to spend too too much time on camp. I just want to give people a, a little insight on it. But something I do want to dive into and talk a little bit more is, is just kind of your philosophy, if that's the right word, maybe your approach when it comes to developing quarterbacks. You've been a, a few schools before UTSA mm-hmm. and Carnot Ward being one, which you were there several years, and you've been assisting and have helped develop quarterbacks, not just quarterbacks, other players in general. And UTSA has done a great job, of course, with their quarterback development lately, and with with Frank Harris being one of the best quarterbacks in all of college football. So could you just kind of go through your approach and, and what you one look for in a quarterback and then two, maybe some traits you feel like quarterbacks have to have and some traits you feel like you can kind of help develop and, and push in the right direction, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I'll speak first to just UTSA um, in, in terms of what we're looking for. You know, when we, one of the coolest parts of this process when, when this staff got put together was we had at the time, I think six or seven former college quarterbacks in the room. Wow. Barry Lunny, our first OC, Will Stein, uh, who at the time was the receivers coach, um, Justin Burke, who was an analyst, myself, who was an analyst, Hunter Riddeman, who started um, his college career at Texas Tech as a quarterback and then moved to receiver. Um, you know, we had a lot of quarterbacks in the room and with Coach Trailer's background coaching quarterbacks in high school all those years. So a lot of opinions, which can be good and bad. The beautiful part of it is Coach Trailer assemble the staff with with like-minded people. He says it all the time, like-minded people surround themselves with like-minded people. So when we built this system from a schematic standpoint, that kind of helped us frame um, the kind of guy we were looking for. Um, and, and Coach Trailer believes it, and we all believe it from the top down, is we have to have a guy that has mobility, athletic ability. You can frame that, define that many different ways. We need a guy that can use his legs. 
can use his legs to create um, when the pocket breaks down to extend plays, to scramble, to run. Now, we've got some guys in our room that are 4'8 guys. We've got some guys in our room that are 4'6", 4'5 guys. Like, there's not a magic number. Um, I'd say there probably is a cutoff number in terms of speed and 40 times and all that. But how does he use his legs? Can he create Can and extend plays? Um, and then is he a threat in the run game? We're not going to sit here and run zone read 40 times a game, but that he has to have that element to his game where the defense has to account for him, run or pass. Um, as a passer, there's a difference between being a thrower of the football and a passer, right? A thrower is, I mean, yeah, you can make all the throws. A passer is understanding when to put touch on it, when to drive the ball, when to put it on a specific shoulder away from the defender, ball placement, tempo, those kinds of things. So, for us not being a power five school, it's going to be hard for us to find the perfect blend of that guy that's an athlete and a true passer. What we believe, um, whether that's confidence or arrogance, it's a very fine line. What we as a program, as a staff believe is we can help develop a guy. It's easier to develop a guy as a passer than it is right. as an athlete. Like you're born with certain abilities, right? And so we can only make a guy so much faster. Um, what we can do is we can structure the game plan um, the scheme around his ability as a passer, whatever that, whatever degree that is, while still forcing them to account for him as a runner. And so we're not triple option, right? Everybody's seen us play. Frank Harris threw for 4,000 yards last year and ran for 600. Um, and probably half of that 600 is him being creative and extending plays and taking off. So that's a long answer to say how we built the scheme, what we look for in guys, um, and my philosophy on that is, has, has changed kind of where I've been and what the offense has been. And, you know, I was at Wyoming and we were very pro style, 21, 12, 22 personnel, 11 personnel, very, very rarely. And here very rarely we're in, we're, we're not in 10 personnel here either. However, at Wyoming, we were 21, 22, a gap power, wide zone, play pass, those kinds of things. So what we were looking for in a quarterback was different. And that was with the the from the head coach down again with Coach Bowl and his philosophy and Brent Vegan, who was the OC at the time. He's now the head coach at Montana State. Mm -hmm. His philosophy, um, and so it's been different. I've been kind of I've been able to you know as a coach you do you you take nuggets from everywhere you've been and everybody you've been around. Um, so that's kind of what that process has been like for me in terms of the the philosophies I've been around in, in recruiting a guy and what we look for here. Um, from a development standpoint, you know, I think it, it points to how we built the scheme and, and what we ask our quarterbacks to do from a mental process, from reading defenses, and then what types of reads we have. We've boiled our whole offense down, our whole passing game down to nine reads. Now, those nine reads, there's, there's different wrinkles to each of them, but what it does is it frames their thought process and it tells them how to read this type of concept. And then they have to know quick game, drop back timing, et cetera. Um, but I think that's one of the reasons Frank is, has been able to thrive is the way that this thing was built. There was a ton of thought and a ton of effort put into it by the group. Um, I've been fortunate to be a part of Frank's career here for an, a number of years. We've been together now. This will be our fifth year together. Mm -hmm. and, I, and we've been able to develop a, a, a great relationship. I love him to see him grow. So much credit to him and how he's grown. Um, and, and we've been able to put pieces around him to allow him to succeed in the passing game, but he has willed and worked himself yeah. into the player that he is. There's no doubt. I mean, he's, he's a stud. Yeah, that's a, that's a dope answer. I really like what you said when you compare the two different style of offenses when you're at Wyoming compared to now being two different style of offenses, none's right or wrong. It's just right. that develop. I mean, that kind of dictates what your quarterback philosophy is at the, at the time. And so now you kind of have a blend approach. It kind of seems like uh, when it comes to the, the overall structure of, of, you know, developing a quarterback, if you will. And I want to get to Frank Harris more here in a, in a second, but one thing I do want to touch on before we talk about Frank Harris, because you talked a little bit about it, but the recruiting side of things that when, when recruiting a quarterback, you talked about stuff you're looking for, you want a quarterback that can move. He doesn't have to be a burner, but he has to be able to move and you can kind of develop other other traits, but when recruiting a quarterback, especially right now, because you've had so much success with Frank Harris and, you know, UTSA has had so much success the past few few years. Does that 
make it tougher or easier to get quarterbacks in because they know mm-hmm. they have like a solidified guy if that if that kind of makes sense then also um i know i think you had one transfer portal quarterback come in this year if i'm not mistaken is that how, how has that changed as far as like okay we're recruiting a high school guy we're recruiting a transfer portal guy do we see who's in the portal do we just kind of you know, do, do both, like uh, whoever fits best, kind of kind of go af- after, just kind of talk about the recruiting side of things, if that makes sense. Yeah, um, there's no way, there's no easy, clear cut answer to that, um, at least for us. You know, I, I think it's, it's, we more focus, I would say we more focus on a number. We're going to take one or we're going to take two. And you look at the depth of your room in terms of the ages. It used to be right, like okay, we've got we've got a senior, two juniors. We need to sign a freshman, or we've got one senior, three freshmen. We need to go sign a transfer guy, right? A JUCO guy. Well, now with the portal, it's so everything is so fluid. Um, like this this last class, we took one high school kid, and then we ended up taking a transfer portal kid late, and our room was 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 full. And so we have to get down to our scholarship number that we have allotted. And so had to have a couple honest, difficult conversations with our guys um, in the room. And, and you do your very best to handle that with with honesty, but with love. You got to value them as humans. And so um, those conversations are not fun and they're not easy, but it's part of the job. It's part of the game. It's turned into this business. Right. We all understand that. And so. Um, ended up having two guys get in the port, three guys, excuse me, get into the portal, um, two scholarship guys and one walk on guy because there's just not a rep, enough reps to go around. And so um, right now, as we stand here today in July, we're going to take one mm-hmm. um, and we have one committed. And recruiting is crazy. You never know, like nothing should surprise anybody anymore between NIL and portal and all that stuff. So um, it's, it's always a fluid situation. So that's my roundabout way of not really answering the question. <laughs> it's fluid. It, it, that, the concrete answer is that it's fluid. No, I think I think that was a, that's a great answer because I think it's great insight for people to realize like there's no black and white kind of yeah. uh, answer to that. You know, it's always like, to be honest, it, it depends is probably the best answer, right? So right. I think that's just a good insight for people to, to kind of hear and, and, and realize. Uh, I know it's like super, super, interesting and you know especially with the nil and the transfer portal come at the same mm-hmm. time and stuff going on that you know managing that can can i'm sure be be a lot but with that said let's, let's talk a little bit more about frank harris i think he's a guy who has gotten more attention as of late which is good but still probably a lot of guys haven't seen him play a lot of fans haven't seen him play and he's not just one of the best quarterbacks in in, in the aac now or g5 but in all of college football um we've done several just, just videos to try to kind of you know, get him out there and get get more recognition just about him because there's a talented, talented quarterback. Can you go over, you mentioned a few things, can you go over, go over and just maybe uh, a bit more details or maybe even like an example of a play in a game that kind of something that really makes him special and kind of separates him from the rest of the pack and then um, an area that like he's really developed in that has kind of taken him to that, that top tier level in college football. Yeah, uh, there's so many examples. I mean, it's hard. It's so hard to narrow down one. I, I think, you know, um, I'm trying to think of, of a run and a pass example. Yeah. You know, and 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 from two years ago when when we won our first conference championship together um, as as a as a program as a staff. Um, you know, I, I think there was a play against UAB. That, that I mean, there were a ton of plays against yeah. UAB in that game. Um, uh, and, and in the in the in the conference championship game, but UAB was was a, a, a tough test, and it always is. Those guys are 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 really really good. Mm-hmm. Their defense is very salty. They had a great pass rush. They always have. Third and I want to say thirteen or fourteen, we run a shallow dig concept, and and he freaking sits in there in the pocket, cloudy pocket, and rips the ball to the dig and puts it in a place where only our guy can get it. And our guy goes up and catches it and gets gets tackled right away, and we get a first down. And that was an elite throw. Mm-hmm. And so many people think of him as this dual threat guy, and he is. I mean, he is. If you don't honor him as a runner, he's gonna he's gonna hurt you. Um, but that one throw was like okay, like, and and we had already seen it in that in the season, but in that moment, in that game, 
that magnitude just sitting in there and making that throw. And then since then he's had, he's had so many throws. I mean, how many two minute drills has the guy led 24, 27 seconds again against U of H last year to tie the game mm -hmm. in overtime. He makes two incredible throws. Um, uh, same thing against UAB in that same game two years ago, makes two incredible throws on the drive. Like he, he makes plays when it matters and, and he's made those plays as a passer. On the flip side, he's made so many plays as a runner, just creating with his legs. Teams playing man coverage, U of H playing man coverage last year, and he pulled it down and, and ran and scored. You know, um, same thing against uh, Western Kentucky two years ago. You know, he just he he's a really good football player, and and I can't give him enough praise. And and we all have our warts, and we're all imperfect people, and and I have mine, and and he has his, but he has made a lot of plays for us and and what he has done in his career here with his development and you asked about what has kind of helped helped him take that yeah. next step and kind of set him apart is um he's always had a tremendous work ethic um what he did was he took that work ethic and he applied it across the board so many guys think like you know in the new quarterback series kirk kirk cousins talks about it where in high school you know obviously we're not in high school but in high school like I don't need to study. I'm, I'm, I'm an athlete. Academics don't matter. You know? And he's like, well, I basically take a final every Sunday is what he said. And, and Frank's approach to his craft, the way he takes care of his body, the way he studies and prepares the, the way he takes notes, those kinds of things. And so that's basically a, a, a wordy way of saying his football IQ. I mean, yeah. he has, he has grown in leaps and bounds in his football IQ because of the way he prepares. And it's not that he's learning more. I'm not saying that he didn't, he never had a good foundation. He's always had a solid foundation with his football IQ, but understanding tendencies and mm -hmm. coverage structures and the way defenses are built and what they're trying to do with the way that they play and the way that they align. I mean that with his football IQ and the mm -hmm. way he processes that quickly in game and makes decisions. He's gotten, he's gotten better and better every single year. Mm -hmm. I think with his athleticism and his skill set, when you combine that with how he's grown, from the mental side of the game and his preparation, that's what that's that's the formula now. That's the product that we see. Yeah, super super dope, and definitely you can see it on the field as his numbers have continued just to skyrocket up. And I know with the 2023 season coming up, I know we're expecting and there'll be a lot of good Frank Frank Harris uh, plays. Hopefully, not as many close calls for y'all, but uh, <laughs> see y'all can yeah. breathe it a little bit better. That's just part of part of football, especially when you're playing so many great teams and. Um, are you, are you pretty excited to jump into the AAC? Is that just like a fun new thing? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. We are. I mean, you know, you, you always welcome challenges, whether right. they're new or old, you know, you always want to be challenged. You learn yeah. so much from being challenged. It reveals things, you learn things. And so what we have, it's, it's so unique. Like we're going into a new conference, but we're still playing four opponents or four or right. five opponents, four opponents that we've played the last two years. Um, and so, that there's still some familiarity there and then we'll play four or five i think four new yeah. opponents in the aac so our non-conference we've got um uh you know we open up at u of h um they're always they're always really good yeah. and tough yeah. and that defense is phenomenal um and they're going into the big 12 and and so who they've been able to recruit from going into the big 12 yeah. is different in a good way who we've been able to recruit from going into the AAC is different in a good way. So we're both experiencing transition, um, but they're really good. Uh, yeah. And then we get to play Texas State, who GJ and, and yeah. that staff, he's built a tremendous staff yeah. and he's done a phenomenal job everywhere he's been as a coordinator, yeah. now as a head coach um, and his relationship with Coach Trailer and his history there. And, and so many guys on our staff, no one guys on their staff. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Army on a short week, that'll be fun. Yep. It always yep. is. And then obviously going to Tennessee. So yep. non-conference is, that's no joke. I mean, those yep. are four tough opponents. And people can say, ah, no, that, no. Like that's in this building, those are four really tough opponents. And, yep. and um, we talk about win the day and stacking yep. days. And so you yep. can zoom out and you can see that. You can look at that schedule and be like, oh, my God, that's tough. Right. Yeah. And we do. But what you have to do is you have to be able to zoom in and you got to win the day and you have yeah. to stack great day on top of great day. And that's how you're able to put things together over a four or five month stretch is it's day by day. And as a yeah. human, that has helped me immensely as mm -hmm. a man, as a husband, as a father. That's helped me immensely. Um, and so all that being said, it, it will be fun to have new and old challenges yeah. um, and obviously yeah. some some 
um, just uncharted waters for us. Yeah. Um, it'll be really fun. It will. Yeah. It's always fun, like to watch the like the UTSA UVH game was one of the best games in college football last year, right? Coming down the wire and back and forth, and so always fun to watch that. And then Texas State, I think everyone in Texas knows, like Texas State is at some point they're going to be really, really good. Like oh, the state sure. of Texas, like it, it's coming, and it's probably going to be the, the new coaching staff. So like uh, that's always going to be fun. And then of course um, Army with a triple option, that's always a tricky thing to prepare yeah. for. And then Tennessee, I know y'all played at Texas last year. So now Tennessee is like y'all's, I guess big school if you will yeah to, to yeah out. that's yeah that's gonna be dope um that's have y'all already i know coaches are different do y'all take the approach like have y'all started game planning for games outside of week one or is it like week one then week two or do y'all spend a few minutes or a few hours a week on one game and then you know kind of trickle it down if you will do y'all have like a, a a structure to that or is it kind of just as you go you kind of prepare for yeah, we do. Um, but with June being so fluid now with recruiting and all that, like it's it's tough to to accomplish as much yeah. as I think everybody wants to. But um, we still, you know, and I've been places where, you know, that's what you do in July or that's what you do in June or you basically take your non-conference because that's typically four games. Um, and that's what you work on in, yeah. in the summertime. Um, and so uh, we have we've gotten a, a, a head start now to varying degrees. Right. Week yeah. one, obviously, no matter who it is, you're going to have more done as opposed to week four. And right. so um, whether that's like putting thoughts on paper, like just in pencil, like, hey, I'm maybe this or maybe this or just, hey, this is kind of what they do structurally. It's kind of it varies from week yeah. one to week four. But we have we've peaked at least peaked at our first four and spent more time obviously on week one just because right. it's week one yeah yeah no that, that, that's a good good insight good answer uh how much how much time do you are you able to spend with the quarterbacks during the summer like are you able to have like quarterback meetings and kind of chop it up or is it you know, yeah so ncaa rules with between practice and all of that like however much we practice that takes away from our meeting time um, okay. but because we use a ball now in the summer the majority of our meetings are installation okay um and so from a calendar year perspective, like we'll do in February after signing day and after recruiting shuts down, we'll do our quarterback school. Okay. Um, so that's where we talk about defensive ID. What does that look like? Gaps, you know, front structures, um, contain support coverage, how all those things are related, shells, et cetera. Um, try to set that foundation in February and then go into spring ball. Uh, and then May, we're on the road recruiting. Summer, you come back. If you have time to review that, you can, but then you're going through your summer practice schedule, whatever that looks like. And so for us, that's we're spending our time on installation um, and, and just reteaching things from the spring and introducing maybe a new idea or two, um, depending on the week or, or just kind of where we're at with install. So um, we do get time with them. I, I'm very fortunate. We are very fortunate that we have a group that is that they all like they want to get better. And mm -hmm. and that's that that sounds kind of like coach speak and an overgeneralization. But, you know, all of our guys are always in the building, yeah. whether they're in my office or the quarterback room or whatever. They're watching tape and they're learning and they just they want to get better. And, and that's part of what makes them a special group. And, and we've got and not just at the quarterback position. I mean, you know, to be successful you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And so, you know, every position group um, is special because of who those people are starting with the coaches. It's a special staff, but then, you know, we've, we've done a good job of identifying obviously really good players, but really good right. people and right. guys that, that represent who we are, the way we want to play, the way we want to live our lives and, and live out the culture. And again, yeah. culture gets thrown around a lot, but, but our guys embody it. They live yeah. it. And that's one of the reasons we've been so successful. Yeah, absolutely. No, it, it might get thrown around a lot, but it has a, a big meaning, especially at a program like UTSA and the success you have had. Coach, I'm, I'm going to get you out of here in a few. I, I promise. And I'm You're fine. Along. You're uh, fine. So, something I always ask the, the the players that we have on, the quarterbacks we have on, is is what is their pregame rit ritual, right? Like the mm -hmm. music they're listening to, like their, their warm up, like what's the routine? But coach, do you have a routine? Is there something you go through? Because I know you get knots in your stomach too before a game gets going. Yeah. Like the butterflies, is, that is what it is. It, it tends to happen. Do you have a, a ritual or routine you go through, or is it just like, you 
No, I, I do. It's I, I'm, I'm not super. I'm not superstitious. Um, you know, as Michael Scott would say, I'm not even a little stitious. Um, <laughs> good, good, good reference. <laughs> yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, shout out, Coach Lunny, who's at Illinois now. He was a huge office guy. Tons of office and Seinfeld references when, okay. when he was with us. But um, yeah, I do. I mean, I'll, I'll listen to music, but the music that I'm going to listen to is just going to help keep me calm. Um, you know. Uh, and it's it's random. It's it's not. Sometimes it's worship music. Sometimes it's jazz. Sometimes it's R and B. It just I don't have a song or a play. Yeah. It's just kind of what I'm feeling that day or for that moment or whatever. Um, get to the stadium and then really like um, maybe I'm different. I don't know. Um, I want my guys to feel good and, yeah. and I want them to feel confident and prepared. And ninety nine point nine percent of that is Sunday through Friday right? Game day, when we go out there pregame, we'll go out there together as a group, just in t-shirt and shorts. You get to the stadium, hey, how much time you need to get changed and tape? 15 minutes, great. We'll be out there at three o'clock, whatever. Then we'll go out there and, and pray it up real quick and then mm -hmm. have them warm up uh, on their own. And then we'll do maybe three or four drills uh, and that's it. And then we'll go throw some, some balls to the receivers for about five minutes and then if, if they want to be done, they can be done and go in. If they want to stay out on their own, they can. And then once we get to like actual pregame, we've got a little bit of a routine, but we don't have hardly any individual. We're with a pos another position group or, or, or it's seven on seven or team. So um, it's a group, it's a group conversation. And really it's, it's me and, and, and the starting quarterback saying, Hey, what do you want to do? What do you need to get ready? Yeah. Do you need this? Do you need this? Do you want this? Mm -hmm. Do you want me to leave you alone or you want me to, to, to smack you in the head with your helmet? Right. You know, like whatever that guy needs, whatever that group needs is what we're yeah. going to do. And it had, because Frank's been the starter for, yeah. for four years now, it hasn't changed. Yeah. Um, and whenever there's a new starter here, um, I would imagine they probably wouldn't want to change a whole lot, but that's just part of the conversation yeah. and whatever they need to get ready that day, then that's what we're going to do. Yeah. That's dope. And you, you mentioned going to going to the stadium together and, and UTSA having the, the Alamo Dome is, is one of the best stadiums in all of the group of five football, of course. And uh, I don't know if people realize it, but the fans UTSA has too are, are, are you know, they, they show out, they tailgate. Uh, my wife played soccer at UTSA years ago. Okay. So we have a little bit actually years ago before when UTSA was getting started, their football program. Uh, I got recruited by UTSA in high school a long time ago. I ended up going to play somewhere small, and my only touchdown in college was to the other team. That tells you how good I was. <laughs> but, uh, but, but I always remember just the fans at, at UTSA, and you know we, we've been keeping up with them. But with that said, the Alamo Dome, obviously super dope. What's been your favorite stadium to go to outside the Alamo Dome that you've had in your coaching career, where it's like the environment's crazy, or maybe it's not crazy, it's just like the scenery's nice, whatever it may be. What's, what's, yeah. what's your favorite place to go to? Oof. Um, well, I mean, UT was crazy because there was yeah. 104, 102. I don't know. There was, was 100 plus. Um, right. And, and that was obviously really cool. Um, yeah. When I was at Wyoming, we played at Hawaii. That was fun. Okay. Uh, yeah. Nice yeah. little road trip. Uh, and that was yeah. the wives road trip. That was the wives trip. So yeah. um, my wife, we got a little, you know, we had one night together in Hawaii. Right. Um, and and so that was obviously special. Yeah. Um, trying to think, you know, I spent a lot of time coaching high school and JUCO ball and then FCS ball, and those are mm -hmm. unique stadiums yeah. and unique settings. And I've seen some pretty terrible locker rooms, and I've seen some <laughs> terrible fields. And you know, I was coaching right. when I was coaching JUCO. We we played an opponent in California. I coached JUCO in Southern California. We, Played an opponent, bleachers are only one side. Okay, that's not mm -hmm. a big deal, right? We're on our sidelines. Right. We're away from the bleachers. Well, there's no coach's booth. And so uh, the coach's booth was um, a scissor lift. Um, oh, wow. That went about three miles an hour down the sideline. And so if we had an explosive play, it would just kind of yeah. work its way down the <laughs> sideline. So I've seen some unique things, um, some different things. Um, but the coolest, I think, oh, we played at AM a few years ago, too. Okay. That was cool. Yeah, that's dope. Um, you know, so you get to see some cool things. Neyland Stadium, obviously, will be really special. Right. It'll be really fun. Yeah. Um, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, 
you're so fo like you you can pause and take a moment like before it all starts national anthem something like that and kind of look around and be like okay this is really cool yeah um but then once you put that headset on you, you get so tunnel vision and laser focused and and it can be hard to kind of stop and take some snapshots you know unless you're you're winning big or something right. like that so um that can be difficult sometimes but those were those are the ones that stand out yeah uh, that's dope that's a cool story about the scissor lift uh, <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i hate to have a malfunction on that no doubt um, all right, Coach. Well, I'm going to get you out of here here in a second. But what, one thing I do want to hammer home is this the, the great job that UTSA has been doing on the development side of things. It's a program that develops football players. I think that's the best way to describe it. They develop football players. And, you know, we're a quarterback show, so we spend the majority of time yeah. talking about the quarterbacks. And so Frank Harris has just done a, a hell of a job. And uh, we're super excited to see the program continue. But before I get you out of here, I always like asking coaches and quarterbacks themselves when they get out, like, what is your advice to uh, a quarterback? Let's call it a quarterback in high school who has some time. Talent. He, he's not like some guy trying to make JV. He's a guy getting recruited. Uh, what would be your, your your main advice to to that quarterback? Not a five star blue chipper, but a guy yeah. like fringe D one. Let's call it. What would be your advice to them? Um, that's very open ended. I think in a good way. <laughs> yeah. um, you know, I, I the new thing these days. Not new thing. It's not new. Hell, people have had quarterback trainers forever. But quarterback trainers, right? There's there's a lot of them. Who do you choose? Why do you choose them? How do you choose them? I, Whatever that process is like for you, what I would urge anybody to do is once you find one you like, that you vibe with, that you like their style and you see the improvement that you're looking for, or you feel like you can be the best version of yourself with that person helping you, um, stick with that person. Yeah, don't good. be a guy that goes to four different people. Just because a group of receivers is going to throw with this trainer, don't go show up there. You know, you can't go show up there, but I mean, you're just getting too many voices. Mm. Um, we have no problem with guys using trainers, right? Yeah. No problem at all. You know, Frank's worked with Quincy Carter the last yeah. year. I love Quincy. He and I have a great relationship. Um, I do. I love Quincy. He's awesome. Um, you know, we've got Owen McCown in our room, right? Whose dad played 17, mm. 18 years in the NFL. Right, right. So, uh, that's hard to argue with, right, yeah. with his dad. But, you know, he goes and, and sees a guy, um, John Beck, I believe. You know, we've had some guys um, work with Brad Stanfield. We have some guys work with Yale Vinoy, who's here in San Antonio. I don't I don't care who yeah. you work with uh, right. because the nature of it now is what they're teaching is they're teaching a lot of different off-platform and creative throws and and sometimes arm slot mechanics, those kinds of things, rotation, um, being a rotational thrower. We don't have the time because of the NCAA calendar. We don't have the time to work on those things mm -hmm. with those guys. And so it has become a necessity and I think a good one if quarterbacks go about it the right way right. for their development. So from a development standpoint, I would say that. From a recruitability standpoint, um, you know, you always talk to these kids and, and you're trying to get an eval on them. And so for us being group of five, you know, we're trying to eval a kid. Well, he's going to go to camp at Baylor and he's going to go to, to A&M and he's going to go to UT. He's going to go to these camps, which he's not on their board, you know, or for us getting a kid to come here who's got a bunch of FCS offers, who's not on our board, but he wants to go to the UTSA. That They're chasing the camp exposure and the logos when what you should be chasing is an eval. You want people to evaluate you and and the best evaluation you're going to get is from the people that want to evaluate you, that know you're coming, that want you to come. Um, and so that and then the other thing is, is I think that the third thing that stands out in my mind um, is unfortunately that's it's turned into a high school transfer portal. Um, and so I'm not saying don't transfer. There's a million good reasons to transfer. Um, but if you look at a kid's high school track record and he was at three schools, well, then you got to ask why, why was he at three schools? Um, and so, um, that can help guys, right. To transfer, to get mm -hmm. playing time. I get it. But if you're transferring two or three times, like, okay, then what, what is the issue? And maybe it's valid, but it just right. forces us to ask more questions. Um, not necessarily give us pause, but there's something to be said for earning something. Now, granted, you're a freshman and you think you can play and you got a, a sophomore in front of you and you feel like you only get one year as a starter, then yeah, I get it, right? But just the reasons behind it is what I'm getting at, you know, behind transferring. So everybody has them. 
Um, some are good, some are bad. It is what yep. it is. It's the nature of it. And so, yep. um, I think those are kind of the three things that, that yeah. are in front of my mind. Yeah. I think that was, that's a great answer. It kind of hits on, on everything and it all wraps into the developmental side of things somehow, some way, right. You got your, your, your physical development, getting with a really mm-hmm. good quarterback trainer that you trust and, and let him continue to help your development. You have your, your mental side of things that you, that you kind of mentioned as far as, uh, you know, why are you going to these camps, go to get evaluated. Don't just go to, you know, to go to logo. And then you had the the other side of things where, you know, just have a reason why you're doing something, which I think can translate to, to anywhere in life. So, uh, coach Davis, thanks so much for, for coming yeah, on. Is, is there any other, la- any other shout outs, anything you want, you want to, uh, give out to our, to our, to our, our listeners of millions of people out there, anything you want to shout out to? <laughs> I just want to say thank you, man. I thank yeah. you for choosing me. Um, oh my gosh. I've, I've had an interesting journey and, you know, you said you read about it. And so I, yeah. I feel incredibly fortunate to be where I am. Um, mm-hmm. I'm incredibly humbled to be here, a part of this staff. I feel incredibly humbled to have the position that I have. Um, you know, obviously it's, it's, this is a, can be a fickle business and I'm yep. fortunate to be surrounded by people I like, people I like working with. I like them as individuals. Um, I would choose to be friends with these guys. So I'm in a yeah. special place with special people. Um, I got to remind myself of that. Not to remind myself. I got to pinch myself. And when it gets tough, I got to remind myself of that. Yep. Like you, you are in a great spot. Uh, yeah. And so um, thank you to the people that I work with. Thank you to you for having me on. Mm. Um, and, and I don't want to, I, I don't want people to, to, lose sight of Frank Harris is a good player first and foremost because of Frank Harris. Mm. Our head coach says it all the time. You are the most important to our players. You are the most important coach in your life. Mm. Um, And so have, have we all had a part of it and played a role in it? Yeah, we have. Um, I've been with him for four years. And so I'd like to think I've played some part in his development, but it starts with Frank. Mm. And yeah, his skill set, but just his work ethic yeah. and his character and who he is. And he's earned it and he deserves it. Um, and we're excited to have one more shot with him um, to continue to help him develop and grow. Um, and let's go see what we can get done this year. Yeah. Yeah. Su- super dope stuff. You got uh, UTSA fans here pulling for you. So uh, <laughs> awesome. we wish you all the best of the season. And anyone that watched, please like, subscribe, all that YouTube and podcast jargon. And we'll see you all next time. Peace. Awesome.